On this episode of Quest of Dose, we are back for the new year. We are back for year three of having the sports opinions umbrella. And me and David, my brother, are back in a big way. We talk college football playoff, NFL Black Monday with coaches firings, hirings. We talk about Dallas hiring Mike McCarthy. The NFL wildcard round and division uh, round preview. Western Conference versus Eastern Conference depth in the NBA and how Western Conference supremacy is a myth. The Brooklyn Nets need to practice better transparency, and we are both hyped up about the XFL coming. What's going on, sports fans? Welcome back to Cuesta Dos. Here with my brother, David Cuesta. I'm Alex Cuesta, and we are kicking off the new year. The actual calendar new year, 2020, we're kicking off the third year of Sports Opinions Podcast as a brand being around. And this is the first show we're doing in the new year. What's up, Dave? Uh, Nothing much. It's weird. It feels like we haven't recorded in a while, and maybe it's because we have, but still, it feels longer than it has been. It's been two weeks. We took a nice little hiatus for Christmas and uh, New Year's, which that's fine. I'm okay with that. We're, we're even allowed to celebrate a little bit as well. We're not uh, we're not barred out from doing that. But it's nice to be back. It's nice to talk some sports. And Dave, we got a lot to do. Are you ready to get going? Very, very ready. All right. Let's start this up. Let's do it. We're going to start off with, uh, you know, there's been a bunch of hot button topics, but I think this one is a good one to start with. College football playoff. It, it's It happened. It's beginning. It's... Two games deep, semifinal is done, final is coming up, I believe, this weekend, right, Dave? I think it's this weekend. Yeah, I believe so. But we'll talk, uh, we're going to start off talking about the semifinal, which happened last week. And, uh, you know, one game was an absolute laugher and a blowout. The other one was a fantastic game. Dave, Joe Burrow showed why he's the Heisman. Yeah, he was very mean. Seven touchdowns thrown. Every single touchdown in that game. They scored 63 points. Joe Burrow threw every single one of them. Yeah. And Lincoln Riley and Oklahoma get blown out again in a college football playoff semifinal. First, I want to talk about that real quick. We know Joe Burrow is great. We know LSU is fantastic. What the hell is going on in Oklahoma? They get there and they get either beaten pretty handedly where they score some garbage time or they get destroyed. Are we just overrating Big 12 teams that they get in like this? Yeah, probably. I mean, honestly, I would, you would, if I were to say that we would have had a better game if Alabama was there, I think everyone would agree. Or if even Georgia was there, we might have had a better game, even though Jake Fromm is not as good as people want to make him out to be. It would probably still have a better game. Yeah, more than likely. And, you know, I just think that Oklahoma has a good history. And one thing about college sports in general, with I think basketball and football being the main is, history a lot of times trumps what is actually there. So Oklahoma is one of those prestige programs that has had a lot of success in the past. So they're going to get the nod over a lot of other programs that deserve to be there. So I think that's exactly what we saw at the Oklahoma. And they're going to be a point to something. They're going to be the main focal point of something that I'm going to say in a little bit. But we'll talk about the second game. Second game to me is interesting because this is a team that people were arguing shouldn't be in the college football playoff because the ACC is weak. Clemson, number three, goes out and beats Ohio State, number two, 29 to 23 in a really good game. Um, in a game where there were some officiating calls that were questionable. But overall, Clemson played well enough to win that game over an Ohio State team that was pretty stacked. Is Is this something where... You know, again, we're kind of underrating Clemson, where the ACC was quote-unquote weak, and Ohio State comes out of a pretty tough Big Ten. So automatically, I think everyone was thinking Ohio State's going to win. Clemson's a defending national champion for a reason. Dabo Sweeney's a great coach. What did you see in that game, Dave, that maybe gives you hope that Clemson's going to put up a fight against LSU? Uh, The fact that they put up a fight against Ohio State. (laughs) Do you think I Ohio think, State was enough of a matchup for LSU as well? Uh, uh, well, Ohio State, very explosive team. They obvi- they did big things during the whole year. Uh, so, 
and they were a lot better in Oklahoma. I think they would put up they would put up at least somewhat of a fight against LSU. So I think Clemson's going to put up somewhat of a fight as well. Though I think I kind of conclude that LSU is already. But you never know. Football is a weird thing. Any game, anything could happen. So talking about the final coming up, um, LSU is seeking its first championship six. Nick Saban led them to one and left them. Ed Ogeron deserves a lot of credit. We all make fun of him. We made fun of him initially when he came in because he sounded like the one coach from the water boy. No one can understand what the guy says. He has that hard country. <laughs> kind of sounds like Boomhauer from King of the Hill. But we all poked fun at him. He has that team clicking on all cylinders. He found the guy in Joe Burrow that transferred in there, and his story is amazing. And they seem, you called it weeks ago, I think when we did the podcast three weeks ago, they seem like a team of destiny. We've been saying that since Joe Burrow went into Bama and won. No, once now, that happens, you're going to win. But now Clemson ha- is the defending national champion. Dabo Sweeney has built that program and is as good of a coach as anybody. He's outcoached Nick Saban before, which isn't an easy task. Both him and Ed Ogeron have that now. And Trevor Lawrence won it last year, and it seems like he's stepping up when needed. Can Clemson beat LSU, Dave? Is that a feasible thing to ask of them? I'm I'm going to say yes, mainly because football is football, and experience does play a lot into it. Dabo and Trevor already being there, and obviously Dabo playing a lot. Uh, that coaching in a tough games against Bama, or well, going into tough games against Bama. I mean, I know they blew them out, but it's still the the main problem here is that when Clemson, when Dabo went against like Bama, those big games, Bama is their vaunted defense. Their offense, don't get me wrong, they all they'll always have good offense as well, but it's usually that vaunted defense that we're terrified of. The LSU. Their offense is terrifying. I don't know. I know Clemson's defense is usually good as well, but I don't know if they're going to be able to keep up with LSU because LSU is going to put up points. They're not going to be stopped. Yeah, and if a team like Oklahoma couldn't put up points with them, who's out of the Big 12, which is all they do is score, then it might be trouble for Clemson. But So before we move on, I have to talk about this real quick. Real quick. This year, and since the inception of the college football playoff, it needs to expand. That's all I want to say about it real quick is it needs to be expanded. There has been eight blowouts in 12 semifinal games in its history. It only started in 2015, Dave. Eight blowouts in 12 semifinal games. Two of them have been Oklahoma. There needs to be an expansion because they have one of the biggest things we hear all the time that why it shouldn't expand is or why certain teams don't deserve to be in is, well, they're going to get blown out, right? That's usually the big argument. It's going to be a blowout. Well, from what we've seen in the history is, that's going to happen most of the time anyway. So why not add a few more teams? Let me just throw this out there, Dave. If they went to a simple six or eight team, I'm going to give you the six-team scenario and the eight-team scenario. Six-team, LSU and Ohio State get a bye, right? Then you would have Clemson versus Oregon, uh, Oklahoma versus Georgia. I'd be pretty intrigued by both of those matchups this year. What about you? That would be interesting leading up to both LSU and Ohio State coming off of those two games. That that definitely would be interesting. Yeah, and then you might get Oklahoma out earlier. Yeah. So they wouldn't sit there and be in a semifinal. Okay, let's expand it to eight teams, make it more interesting. You would add LSU playing Wisconsin and Baylor getting a shot to play Ohio State. Now, again, the arguments might be, well, Wisconsin and Baylor would get blown out, right? Oklahoma gets blown out all the time. And let's look at the other, you know, Ohio State has been blown out. Florida State has been blown out. Um, it's It's been blown Notre Dame has been blown out. Clemson's even been blown out before in these games. Washington, Michigan State, a lot of those teams, maybe besides Washington, are all pedigree programs. So I, I don't want to hear that certain teams shouldn't get in or expansion shouldn't happen because of that reason. So that's my little tidbit. I'm hoping it expands. Dave, do you think we're going to get expansion soon? I think we will mainly because a lot of people are calling for it. Uh, Going to eight. I don't know. I think they'll expand to six. I I just think that they're going to take baby steps before they take a big leap. But I think we will see expansion just because of the multitude of people calling for it. Good. I hope so. So that's all I wanted to throw that tidbit in about college. That, uh, you know, I'm excited for the national championship. I enjoyed watching uh, Clemson, Ohio State. I'm just hoping LSU doesn't blow them out because I like good competitive football. 
Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I'm hoping for a good game too, but uh, <laughs> uh, it might get a little ugly. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're going to go from expansion to reductions. Uh, the oh, NFL Black. Yeah, I know, right? The NFL Black Monday happened. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Black Monday is after the last week, week 17, after Sunday, there's a thing called Black Monday where every single team that is absolutely fed up with their coaches and their front office, they get rid of them. And usually we know who's going, and we know that the coaching search is going to be upon us. Multiple teams this year, uh, you probably, if you've been following, you know which ones got rid of them, but Cleveland got rid of Freddie Kitchens and John Dorsey, their GM, which a lot of people didn't expect because everyone seemed to like John Dorsey at least a little bit, but he is now gone as well. So Cleveland has their whole uh, setup just to get done now. Washington, obviously fire Gruden in the middle of the season. They actually collected a coach already. They got Ron Rivera at head coach, and Ron Rivera already, already apparently doing things. He got rid of the ping pong table and something else in the locker room that I guess the Redskins had. <laughs> I don't know. He got rid of those for culture reasons, which, you know what? I agree with that, Ron. You, you, did, you did well enough in Carolina. I think you'll do okay in Washington. Agreed. And Giants got rid of Pat Shermer. Uh, only two years there, but Giants were very underwhelming. So they got rid I of Pat Shermer. I think he was Shermer. like 9-23 and 23 or something exactly. like that. Exactly. It was awful. Yeah, exactly. So, and, but they kept Dave Gettleman. Obviously, they liked, I, I mean, Gettleman might not have done all great things, but they liked Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley. So, Dave Gettleman's saying, and they're looking for a coach as well. And I, the coaching search is really interesting because I we might see some college faces coming up. We might. Matt Rule, Lincoln Riley. We mentioned Oklahoma. Lincoln Riley's definitely in there. Matt Rule is in there from uh, Baylor, who we also mentioned. Now, one thing I saw, Dave, that's interesting is Freddie Kitchens got hired and Dorsey was out. The reason why Dorsey was out is because, like you said, they're starting from scratch. John Dorsey refused to do a major restructure in the whole entire organization. That's why he's out. So the ownership wanted different things than he wanted, and that makes sense. Washington getting Ron Rivera, I think, is really smart. Dwayne Haskins is a young quarterback. I think Rivera could do well with him. And they had a good running game. They have a pretty good defense. And McLaurin can become a legitimate number one. That wide receiver there, the rookie this year. scary Terry. Talented kid. Talented, talented kid. He has some things to work with there. Uh, you know, people were saying that the Giants job was the most interesting job in the NFC East. I put it as Cowboys, Washington, then Giants. I know people love Saquon and Daniel Jones, but they have a negative defense back there. So I like Rivera going there. Giants were looking to hopefully hire Mike McCarthy, but he's going to a team that we were going to talk about. We're going to talk about soon, but I'm going to stick to the Giants for a second. Apparently, Matt Rule Baylor wants that job terribly. And you know what? Go for it. We've seen the young coaches work. We've seen them not work. We've seen college coaches work or not. It's kind of a crapshoot, but a nice young new face in there with different ideas hopefully will work well. I hope Matt Rule can take the media in New York because that's honestly the biggest deal is taking the media here. So let's see what he does. I I don't know, Dave. Who do you think the Giants are going to get? Do you think Rule's the shoe in? It seems like it's going to be Rule. Uh I don't mind rule. The only problem is it gets very hard when you start when you mix young with young. You might have a very good year out of it, but you also might tank out of it because you know rule, young and young coach like head coach wise in the NFL, and and you have Daniel Jones and Saquon, both very young players. Uh, who you're hoping that they can that Gettleman get some uh, veteran blood on that defense and some on that line as well. Maybe that could help rule out when he's in there because he's going to have a lot to do. <laughs> well, you see there. the youth experiment. It worked well last year, both for, um, I think it's Nagy over in Chicago yeah, how, with Chubitsky how did, how and McVay this year. This year with the Ram, last year with the Rams. And this year it definitely took a step back with exactly. both teams. That, so, that's, that's, usually, that's usually how it works. So I, but that, that's the thing. The Giants may have a very good year with rule uh, the first year. But then how is it long-term? You never know. I mean, you could just say it's a sophomore slump for these coaches, but that's also it's also just people seeing what these coaches do, and they're stopping it more now. And speaking of long-term, a guy that had a long-term tenure in Dallas, finally gone after probably being – they've been calling for his head for five years. Jason Garrett officially out with the Dallas Cowboys. Um, 
couldn't really get past mediocrity. He had chances. He had great teams, teams that I think are championship caliber teams, couldn't capitalize. He's out. And quickly, uh, Jerry Jones apparently kept Mike McCarthy in his basement at his house, chained him (laughs) until he signed a contract with blood. Mike McCarthy is their coach, and there's all things that he stayed at his house. I guess Jerry Jones hadn't made pancakes, and pancakes were enough to win him over. Probably Mrs. Buttersworth syrup and everything. It was awesome. In the morning, he was making waffles. Yeah, making waffles. But Mike McCarthy is the new Dallas Cowboys head coach. He also took Mike Nolan from the Saints. He's the linebacker coach, and he's a defensive coordinator. So obviously, McCarthy's going to call the plays. He's an offensive guy. Dave, I like the hire. I've been seeing a lot of flack about Mike McCarthy being picked as the head coach. He's a safe pick that they needed more. I was listening to Colin Coward today. He's saying they needed more progressive. There's a lot of young guys. I don't think that's the truth. I think Mike McCarthy is a fine coach. Um, I think he's smart. He's going to use what he has there. And, you know, he's a Super Bowl pedigree coach. What Everyone initially wanted this guy and now that he's hired by the cowboys it's what ifs i just think it's because the cowboys hired him that people like to hate on the cowboys i like the hire i don't know about you that might be it i don't know i i I like mike mccarthy like he was one of the guys i wouldn't have minded for the jets i i know you know you might be my people might be thinking oh but he's he was out at the packers because you know they're kind of tired aaron Rodgers, like tired of his old style and stuff like that which i have heard and i'm not gonna lie to you Everything I've heard about Aaron Rodgers, he is a terrible person to work with. (laughs) He's absolutely awful to work with. Yeah, I was going to say, he seems like he's kind of a jerk. Extreme talent, but an absolute terrible person to work with. So you don't know exactly if everything that Aaron Rodgers is saying is true about Mike McCarthy. I just want to go with that. But Mike, 9 out of 13 seasons, leads a package to the playoffs. Has a Super Bowl ring. Yeah, he's a safe pick. What do you expect the Cowboys to do with a very well-built team, a team that should make the playoffs, and a team that has a chance at the Super Bowl? I'm sorry, I'm not experimenting with a team that is already built for the Super Bowl. I'll experiment with a team that's rebuilding, because why the hell not? But why even try to chance and throw away a roster that you built for the purpose of winning the Super Bowl? I, yeah. I just yeah, I just don't get experimenting at that point. Yeah, you want a more progressive offense and everything, but I like I, I don't know, man. I just don't get it. And I'm sorry, why do you need a more progressive offense when your best player is your tailback and your line is geared to run the football? We see this year, you brought it up three weeks ago. The teams now team. run the ball and play defense. Every so what do you want to do? Let's get more progressive and have Dak, who is not an elite quarterback, a very good quarterback, but not an elite talent, throw the ball 45 to 50 times a game and maybe win six games instead of 9, 8, 9, 10, 11 when you're just feeding the ball to Zeke. What they need to do is they need to, you know, hopefully Mike Nolan can bring back the Marinelli style of defense and they need to play some defense because their problem isn't necessarily offense. It's that their defense is not very good. They had some good pass rushers that couldn't get to the quarterback this year. That's a defensive scheme issue. And that's where they need to fix there. That's what Mike McCarthy hopefully needs to fix. Listen, there were problems with the Cowboys. And one of the biggest stats that jumps out to me is that they had a positive point differential. And they were 8-8. Eight and eight. How yeah. do you have a positive point differential when you're 8-8? Eight and eight? That you play, should never happen. Dave, you play in the NFC East. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it makes no sense. Why can you? Why? Wait, wait, one in six in one score games? That's obviously a coaching problem. And that's why Jason Garrett needed to be out. Exactly. And I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think Mike McCarthy are, is going to lose that many one score games. Yet again, nine out of 13 times into the playoffs. Nine out of 13. Yep. And, you know, and you know, the biggest problem, what happened with the Packers, I don't know if Mike McCarthy was a part of this. I don't know if he had personnel decisions, but they didn't build around Aaron Rodgers too much, and their defense was terrible. Yeah, and they relied on some of the guys that they found good talent with, Devontae Adams, Jordy Nelson, um, who else? There's another good player that's on that was on the Cowboys now from there, uh, Parker, I think. And 
they just kind of let them rest on their laurels with them and never got anyone to refill when Jordy Nelson retired, when one of the other players left. They never really rebuilt it. And that's the problem. So, uh, you know, I think the Cowboys are going to be fine. I like Mike McCarthy. Yeah, no, they should be fine. I, we're probably going to see him back in the playoffs next year. I mean, you never know what's going to happen with these Eagles roster if they feel like all getting injured again. I, I mean, you're joining the Jets on that train. That oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bad time, but they should be the back. Broad the Broad Street Backups. I've heard that. I heard that's one of their nicknames, <laughs> the Broad Street Backups. That's, that's perfect for this year. Yeah, but the Cowboys <laughs> should be back in the playoffs next year. That roster's too good to not make the playoffs. Agreed. All right, and talking about the playoffs, we had – an outstanding wild card weekend. Oh, yeah. I love these games that happened. Now, we had Texans Bills first. Uh, Bills should have won that game, but they they came back in the first week from a 16-0 deficit, and then they dropped a 16-0 deficit. I'm not gonna lie, it felt great to watch <laughs> the Texans coming back and winning that. But Texans ended ended up coming back, winning an OT off of Deshaun Watson getting smacked around and still standing up. Yeah, that was insane. That end of that game, Deshaun Watson, that really reminded me of Super Bowl Eli when he shrugged off the sack to make the epic throw to David Tyree. That was one of those moments he had, that you he see had, only in the playoffs. He had no right standing up after those hits. That second hit definitely <laughs> kept him up. Oh, 100%. 100%. If, if he comes a second earlier or later, Deshaun Watson is sacked. Yep, but that and, second and we hit We don't was know the perfect. outcome of that game, but Deshaun Watson is sacked if it's a second earlier or later. But, you know, fate had it that the Bills don't win playoff games because the Titans had the Music City miracle against them, and then Deshaun had the sack that wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, so and then now they're cursed. They but are cursed. After God. that, we had Titans-Patriots. Uh, I think all of America, <laughs> everyone who's not a Patriots fan, absolutely loved watching that game. As the Derek Titans, Henry is a grown man. He is terrifying. I feel bad. <laughs> I feel bad for ever doubting Derrick Henry because he seemed like he wasn't able to keep his workhorse status like earlier in his career, but he has been phenomenal for the Titans. Has he entered into that Zeke Elliott, you know, former Le'Veon Bell, but that Shaquan Barkley workhorse level? Oh, 100%. You just give him the ball all game. You saw that in the play. You saw that in that Patriots game. I think he had over 400 yards of scrimmage for the last two weeks from wild card in week 17. Yeah, he had over 200 in wild card, and he had over 200 yards of rushing. And, Ridiculous. And uh, uh, the week 17. Ridiculous. But you saw the Titans. They leaned on their running game. The Patriots played a pass very well. So why even let, why have Tannehill drop back? Leaned Tannehill tried running. to give the game away with that terrible pass. That was awful. But. <laughs> Titans played very good defense. Yes. And they ran the ball all over the Patriots. They frustrated Brady, and eventually that led to a pick six to finish it. And the best moment of the game was Mike Vrabel out Belichick and Belichick uh, yep. by taking the delay a game, taking the false start, running it under five minutes, and leaving Tom Brady one minute and 46 seconds less to work his magic. And Dave, I'm not going to lie. I thought the AFC slate of games looked terribly boring. And they ended up, I like them more than the NFC games. The NFC games are great, but I like the two AFC games better on Saturday and I did Sunday, which is close because Sunday was fantastic too. I think a part of it is that we both got to watch two AFC East teams get knocked out. So that's a added, added victory for us. Yes and no, because I like Josh Allen and Frank Gore. So I wouldn't have minded seeing the Bills go. No, nah, I don't want them to go. Okay. So let's move on to NFC. <laughs> but Sunday, NFC, we had the Vikings and the Saints, and the Saints cannot seem to win against the Vikings for once, uh, one in the playoffs. But they also cannot seem to win close games in the playoffs. They're like the past six times they've been in the playoffs, they lost by one score. And three of those times was the last play of the game. And what surprised me the most is – Dalvin Cook didn't win that game for the Vikings. He almost lost it, actually, with a terrible run by the goal line. Kirk Cousins won that game. And Kirk, that was what was surprising, because Kirk Cousins is talented, but he's had that knock against him that he can't win the big game. It's a Peyton Manning knock. I'm not comparing those two. He's nowhere near Peyton Manning, but it was a similar knock, that Peyton Manning could not win the big game. He was a great regular season guy. Kirk Cousins couldn't win on Monday night, Sunday night football, couldn't win a playoff game. And here he is with a beautiful lob at the end of the game to uh, Rudolph. Beautiful oh, no. lob in yeah. overtime to he win He had it. a great game. I'm not lifting the stigma off him yet. He has to go against the 49ers. 
I'm not going to lie to you. I don't see much of a chance for the Vikings there. The only reason that the Vikings have a chance is because Dalvin Cook runs the ball well. They run the football. That's... He needs to have a better game because he didn't have a, he had 94 yards. He should have had more. I thought Dalvin Cook went down a little easy a few times and he has a shoulder injury, but I thought he went, he didn't look a hundred percent like Dalvin Cook. If he can get back to that, they have a shot at keeping the game close, but the, 49ers yeah. run the ball as well. So Exactly. 49ers are an amazingly built team. But anyway, uh, Saints didn't look good. Drew Brees looked very off his game. Taysom Hill looked fan- fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. If Taysom he Hill, I, we haven't seen him actually throw the ball uh, like medium range, short range. If Taysom Hill can read a defense and throw a ball well, that he's going to be he'll be terrifying if he actually becomes a starting quarterback. If he does that, he's very Kaepernick-esque. We're an unpolished Kaepernick Cam Newton-esque. His body, he's huge. He runs people over. I'm not going Cam Newton because Cam Newton is a legitimate generational talent. That is true, but I'm not going Cam Newton. His style is more Cam than Cap. Cap probably can't run people over like Cam. Yeah, he's just faster than most people. Exactly. But yeah, no, Taysom Hill will be terrifying if he can actually throw the ball around. Uh, I'm hoping Drew Brees, uh, it kind of looked like Father Time caught up to him a little bit that game. A little bit, the, yeah. It's in the dome. That should have been a better offensive uh, outing. But anyway, on to the last game, Eagles-Seahawks. Unfortunately, Carson Wentz, did, uh, he's been cursed. He wasn't allowed to make it through this playoff game. Got knocked out with a concussion or head injury. I, they never called it a concussion it but josh mccown injury. played well in his stead kept josh the McCown eagles alive played very well he played as well as he could against a good seattle defense but seattle yes. just like seattle always does they really don't blow people out they always churn games out now should Clowney have been flagged and ejected for that hit on once a lot of people on social media and around are saying it was a dirty hit he's a dirty player for me that's you take that video and you show your young when quarterbacks I, slide feet first uh, no, no, yeah, that, no, yeah, you show That's the, the biggest slide, part to me. But you can't, you show him the slide, but you can't blame, you can, obviously you can't blame Carson for the injury. You I'm not the blaming slide, Carson Wentz for know, it. Know, head injuries are freak, but. I know you're not. I'm just trying to like. <laughs> that play doesn't happen <laughs> if he slides properly. No doubt. But I, I'm watching it uh, real time. It really looked like Clowney kind of took off before he gave himself up. Well, not gave himself, but before he really started diving. Like, I don't know if Clowney entirely, like, he meant to do that, really. He just meant to hit him. Well, here's the thing, too, that people need to understand. When a player dives forward and their momentum's going forward, that mark is at the end of where the ball hits, when their elbow touches. So if you're watching a guy dive forward and not slide, hell yeah, you want to jump on their back because it shortens how far they advanced the ball. Yeah. I mean, and that's I can, exactly what happened there. Yeah. I can understand. Uh, I, I would need to watch a video like again and again, if I really wanted to, to understand what exactly happened. But if you, if you keep watching a video, I, I mean, if it seems like he dives at him after Carson Wentz is basically three fourths of the way down, I can understand wanting the flag. I'm surprised they didn't throw it. They like to throw those flags. They really do, but they do. officiating is never consistent. So, but it, Carson Wentz and Josh Allen both didn't get calls that they probably yeah. should have gotten. Yeah. And even McCown at one point had a late hit on him that he didn't get. Yeah. No, it's, so, uh, it's the Seahawks, Dave. I'm sorry. The Seahawks get calls, especially in the playoffs. That's I've, true. I've ragged on it before. Me, we all have said they're Russ has earned my respect, especially this year. But we have said that the Seahawks are the luckiest team ever to play the game, and they are. The ball uh, always no, seems no, no. to fall their way. The Steelers will forever be the immaculate they are, reception wins all. But, but the anyway. Seahawks have a little bit of notch up in my heart because Jay Myers represent Marist kicking the hell out of the ball. Even though he missed the first one, he made some. He made another two and yeah. some extra points, so I'm happy with him. Anyway, we're going to go on. We're going to preview the division games real quick. Quickly, real quick, real quick before we preview, I have we to have... say one thing I observed on especially Saturday. We saw the new style of play in the Bills-Texans game with quarterbacks versus a very older style of play with running the ball, quarterback standing in the pocket. Dave, which one do you think is going to prevail? Because next week, everyone plays a similar style to the first game where Tannehill and the Titans are the only ones playing that drop back run the ball style. Where Lamar Jackson runs the ball to open up the pass type of deal. It's a mobile quarterback. 
Mahomes, more of a mobile quarterback. Tannehill can be mobile, but he isn't. What do you think prevails there? Are we going to see the mobile guys prevail more than anything? I think right now we're going to see the mobile guys prevail. The teams are just better. Overall, the teams are just better, so we're probably going to see them prevail more. But I think long term, we're going to we're going to keep seeing these teams pop up to play very good defense and they run the ball very well. Their quarterbacks can be fantastic, but they run the ball very well, and they're going to have their quarterbacks throw whenever they need them to or whenever they feel like they can. I mean, look at the Seahawks. That's the way Russell. That's the way they play with Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson can throw can throw fifty times in a game and he'll be perfectly fine. But and he has to, yeah, he exactly. has thrown the ball forty plus times, fifty times to win. So yeah, let's do these previews real quick. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Let's do these previews real quick. So what do we yeah. have in the AFC? Okay, AFC, we have Titans-Chiefs. Uh, I'm going with Chiefs there, but it could be a very close game. I think that's going to be a shootout. I like the Titans doing what they did to Tom Brady. I, I like know, Derek Henry controlling. My, my bad, my bad, my bad. Texans-Chiefs, sorry. Texans-Chiefs, okay. Texans-Chiefs, I still like the Texans. I like the Texans there because I think Deshaun Watson has a chip on his shoulder because he went from being the next guy to just being a guy, and everyone's doubting him still even after a great a great finish and a gutty performance against a top Bills defense. That's a, yeah, it's a great defense. My biggest I like the problem, Texans there. I like the Chiefs. My biggest problem with the Texans is they're very inconsistent. Uh, uh, Deshaun, he's lost Will Fuller. And Will Fuller, I, I don't think he's great, but he's a, he's a good deep threat. He can always take the top off a of defense. So that's a huge loss. And I just don't see the Chiefs losing that game. J.J. Watt will make a big play to change that game, just like he made a momentum play in the Bills game. He to may, change but it. I don't know if it'll be enough. Anyway, I picked the Chiefs. You picked the Texans. Yep. Whatever. Uh, next game, <laughs> AFC, Ravens, Titans. Ravens. I'm going Ravens. I think the Titans might keep it close for a half, depending on if they can keep their I think the Ravens get out early. The Titans come back in the middle, but don't do enough. Yeah, I think uh, it depends on if the Titans can keep the Ravens off the field. That's Definitely. That's the main thing. Can can they keep feeding King Derek and can they keep themselves on the field and scoring touchdowns? Then it can be a lot closer, but I'm still thinking Ravens. Definitely. NFC, we have uh Vikings versus Niners. I like the Niners there, but I like it to be a close game. I don't think the Niners are going to blow them out. I like the Niners as well. I think it's going to look close in the box score. I don't think it's going to be very close. I think the Niners are going to control it. Unless the Vikings can find a lot of good things with Dalvin. That defense, that Niners defense is terrifying. But Adam Thielen is back and healthy, and you saw the factor that he was in this game. Adam Thielen is a difference maker when Stefan Diggs can't get doubled. But that, that Saints defense is nowhere comparable to that Niners defense. Agreed. That's, Agreed. that's the main thing. And the Niners, can, they're going to keep him off the field. The running game is fantastic. And, and let's see if Jimmy, I, I mean, I think Jimmy G can manage a game. Let's see if he can show up in the playoffs. That's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. He Emmanuel Sanders' reason. championship pedigree is going to show up to help That's him. That's true. That is true. And we're probably right. going to see George Kittle be scary. But uh, yes. Yes. last NFC game, we have the Seattle Seahawks versus the Green Bay Packers. I'm going Seahawks here. I know. I like the Packers. I like Aaron Rodgers. I can never bet against him. When he gets going, when he has a bye and he's rested, and Jones is a legitimate running back. He hasn't had a legitimate running back behind him in a long time. I'm excited yeah. to see the Packers go, and I think the defense is good enough. They're opportunistic. I like them. Yeah. Uh, uh, the reason I'm picking Seahawks, Seahawks are very gritty. Uh, they, and they like beating the Packers, honestly. They but, do. Uh, and, but also the Packers, they, for some reason, they just seem like the worst 13-3 and team I've ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> they've been doubted, and I think that puts a big chip on – Aaron Rodgers' shoulder. That's true. Um, But honestly, I'm not looking at Aaron Rodgers to win this game for the Packers. I'm looking at Jones. Jones is the X factor here, whether or not he's going to have a great game. If he has a fantastic game, then they're going to win. But we got to see. We definitely will. So we're going to switch gears completely from football to basketball, something that I've been complaining about for years, and I'm going to continue to complain, and it's getting closer and closer. There's this big myth that the Western Conference is so much better and so much deeper than the Eastern Conference. And I've constantly, you've heard me saying it, Dave, I keep on saying, hell no, it's not. And here's my reasoning right now, and this is probably gonna be a quicker topic, but it's definitely something. When you look at one of the biggest things, one of the biggest knocks that's always been against the East is a 500 or a team that's a few games under 500 can make the playoffs. Right now, there are two teams sitting at 500 that are potential playoff teams. It's the Nets at seven at um, 
And it's the Magic. Eight. Magic. They're both pl- sitting under 500. They're both sitting. I think the Magic are 16 and 20. Nets are 16 and 18. Yeah. The Nets are expected to finish above 500. And I believe they're going to finish above 500, especially if and when Kyrie returns. And if Karis LeVert gets going, Wilson Chandler continues to score. I think the Nets are going to finish above 500. How far are they going to be? 43 and 39, whatever. I think they're going to get above. Magic, maybe, but who knows? You have at the bottom of the Western Conference is a below 500 team as well. Who Who is it? Let me go look. I had it and I lost it. My phone just freaked out. Well, why'd you jump off of it? I don't know. It's freaking me out. But the you bottom line know. is, if you look at it, there is just as much depth in the Eastern Conference than there is in the Western Conference. Let's let's just take a gander here. In especially the East, right now. Especially right now. In the East, you look at who are legitimate championship contenders in the East. The Bucks, the Celtics, the Sixers. And sitting above the Sixers in three and four are the Heat and Raptors. And the Raptors have been playing extremely well. Pascal Siakam is butting into a legitimate star. Kyle Lowry is very good. And the Heat are hanging around. The, the, the heat, heat, are, are, heat are not going to last. They're going to make the playoffs. They're going to get a good seed. They're not going to last because they're too young. Jimmy Butler yeah. can only do so much for it, but they're a good team. That's a really good team. And then if you go over at the West, so where is that? One, two, at minimum three definite championship contenders, Raptors on the outside chance of defending, correct? Yeah. Okay. At the bottom is the Spurs at 14 and 20 in the eighth seed. 14 and 20. The Spurs are in the eighth seed. Eight seed with the Grizzlies behind them at 15 and 22 and the Trailblazers who everybody talked about how good the Trailblazers are 15 and 22. They should have been. I don't know what the hell and is then, wrong with them. But even more, the T-Wolf Suns and Kings are all in play 14 and 21, 14 and 22, 13 and 23. All these teams are in striking distance at the eight seed in the West. And then let's look at their top teams. The Lakers are a legitimate contender. No one's going to argue that. The Nuggets. I think they're pretenders. They had the best team last year record-wise and couldn't do it in the playoffs. The Rockets, I'm not convinced that the Rockets can be a contender. I know Harden's amazing. I know I love Uncle Russell, Russell Westbrook. But really, are we going to rely on Harden not to disappoint us? He well, does no, it every it's, year. It, I, think, I also think it's mainly the D'Antoni uh, system. Just when Agreed. you don't like playing defense, it's going to hurt your chances. Agreed. And then we have the Clippers, who I think we all agree are legitimate championship contenders. Mm -hmm. The Jazz, I don't believe in them. Donovan Mitchell, I think, has taken a few steps back. That's a good team, not a great team. The Mavericks have Luka. Luka's an X factor, but is I think he's maybe a year or two too soon to be considered legitimate. There's the Thunder, who are sitting in the seventh seed. And Chris Paul is their star, and they have Shai uh, Gorgas Alexander. I think Shai Shai is honestly their star at this point. Shai's legitimate, but is he enough? So oh, let's no. look at it. There are two legitimate contending teams, both in LA. The Rockets on the outside chance, and Mavericks if they really make some noise. But they have less depth in the West this year than the East. So I am just getting so tired and so fed up with all the depth talk. Can we end that today? Can look, we just end that? The, 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 scary, the, the, the scary Golden State Warriors are gone, so now it's not just the West Championship to lose. So <laughs> that, that's a big factor of it. I mean, before that, I know it's the same thing, but and now you can see everything really balanced out, especially with the, with the decision Kawhi made. It, 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 everything balanced out. Thanos came, had the Infinity Gauntlet, Thanos. so we got to do this. We, we got to gotta perfectly balance, man. So speaking of Golden State Warriors and Curry. I'm going to do a quick blip right here because this also pisses me off. All-Star Game fan voting should be eliminated. <laughs> it's stupid. It's a bunch of memers. It's, it's a bunch is. of idiots. That's what it is. So, all right. The Western <laughs> Conference true. The Western Conference front court is fine to me. You have a lot of good names in there. LeBron's a top guy. Dwight Howard's having a resurgent year. He's 10. Brandon Ingram's in there. That's fine. Carmelo Anthony deserves it. It's just off legacy. That's cool. Let me give you some of the guards I have a problem with in the West. Steph Curry hasn't played. Yes. And he's ahead of D'Angelo Russell, his <laughs> teammate who's having a hell of a year. And then you have Alex Caruso, who, like you mentioned, he's just a meme. And he's in there. He's, in not, number he's not bad, eight. but he's nowhere near that good. He's not an all-star ahead of Devin Booker and John Moran. Are you no, serious? No, no way. No. Okay. Yeah, but he's ahead of him in the fan vote. So now we go, now we go on. Go on. Eastern Conference front court. 
everything's fine when you get to six. Taco Fall. Taco Fall. Per he's 36, played, he's averaging like 40 points a game. He's played 13 <laughs> minutes a game. I know. Yeah. And then even, you know what? Bam Abadeo at Abayo has been playing very well for Miami. He's not an all-star. Jimmy Butler is great and makes Bam a lot better because he hangs around the net and dunks a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, and he, I know I've seen some good drives from him in the outside, but he's another one. He's on the outside. And then, I don't know if you'll be surprised, but you shouldn't be. Why the hell is Kyrie Irving the second vote in guards I, 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 in the I East? I saw that. I saw that. I was like, why, why are people voting for Kyrie? I know. He played <laughs> great early. He might not be healthy for the All-Star game. He might not be. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> And then Spencer Dinwiddie sitting there at 10 for some reason behind Bradley Beal, Kyle Lowry, Jalen Brown, Ben Simmons, Zach Levine, and Derek Rose. He should be ahead of all those guys. Yeah, he's played incredibly well for us. You can yeah. see the numbers. You can see the way he plays. It, he's been outstanding. I, and this is not bias here when I say he deserves to be an all-star. Listen, Matt Santos, who I've had on the Sports Opinions podcast proper, one of our good friends, is a big Knicks fan. Absolutely hates the Nets, calls them the empty Nets, makes fun of them all the time. Flat out said Spencer Dimwood is an all-star. He passes the eye test. There's no reason he shouldn't be there. So there we go. That's all you need to know. So that was my little tidbit about how stupid fans are. In yeah, basketball. Well, hopefully. I, 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 the players vote for all-star game in the NBA? I think the coaches do. So I think coaches the... Do. They should probably have the players vote too because that, 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 that would balance things out. That, I think there, the coaches will put Spencer in. I yeah. think they will. Fans need, fans need to get out. The fans are just they're, they're trolls. That's what Terrible. they are. Terrible. Terrible. But talking about Kyrie and Spencer, I have a little bit of a problem with how the Nets have handled uh, Kyrie's injury. <clears throat> now, Kyrie had the shoulder, uh, shoulder injury mm-hmm. earlier in the season. We had that whole thing. He was missing Boston. He was missing Cleveland. He's ducking these games. Everyone's like, oh, he's going to come back soon after that. He's not coming back another week after that. Okay. Guy's still not coming back. Kenny comes <laughs> up. He's like, yeah, you know, he was a day-to-day at first. Yeah, you know, we're looking some things over. We want to make sure. Nothing. Nothing about Kyrie. Barely anything about Karis half the time. Now Karis is back. But now we learned that I, Scoopy reported this. Yep, friend of Sports Opinions Podcast, Brandon Scoopy Robinson. Yep. Kyrie had, I want to say, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, a thoracic bursitis? I think it is. And let me just preface that. I'm not, Scoop hasn't told me anything. I'm not putting words in his mouth. I'm just going off the Twitter. But there's a picture. He was at Kyrie's big event, Invitational, talking to Kyrie. And then later that day, he comes out with the report that it's going to probably be longer because of the bursitis in his shoulder that is causing him a lot of irritation. Kenny Atkinson disputed Scoop's report directly, basically. Yeah. He got a lot of flack for it on the internet. And then Kyrie comes out in and the pregame it. and says exactly what Scoop said. Yep. And my my biggest problem is, listen, I know we were all excited for the whole Ky- for Kyrie this season. We were all very excited. Even without KD, we wanted to see what this team would be. Losing him yet yeah, hurts. Spencer stepped up greatly. Some people haven't stepped up as much as they should have. It's been a little. It's been a weird season. It's been a really weird season. It has been. But just more transparency from the Nets organization about the injury on Kyrie would have been very, very nice. Because I think if you if they just said I, maybe they didn't know when it first started, maybe that's why they said day to day. They really didn't know. But once they had more of an idea, once he was getting the cortisone shot over the surgery. I wanted that. I would have loved them to have come out and said something. Like, like, listen, this we it was screwed up. We didn't entirely know what was going on. Now we do. He's going to be out for longer. We're sorry, but this happened. We want to make sure he's healthy, especially for next season, since we're getting KD back. Unfortunately, I think we need to get used to this. This is just how this organization now plays it. Sean Marks and Kenny Atkinson have been very tight-lipped about injuries since they've come on. When Karras was rehabbing initially, even when Spencer was hurt for a little, we've seen some misdiagnoses with time. Even with Karras this time around, six to eight weeks, it took him over yeah. seven to come back. Yeah. And I don't know if it's just them just, you know, throwing things out and not caring and just trying to keep everything in house and keep it close to the vest. 
the the Kyrie issue to me is they broke a league rule, which is kind of a stupid rule. You have to come out and talk about it. Blah, 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 blah. You have to acknowledge it. You know, it's kind of a dumb rule. I think Popovich is probably another guy who likes to keep all this stuff close to the vest. I think we have to get used to it. I think Kenny, the Nets, Sean Marks are not going to be that open book that we want them to be because we see it work both ways. When people are open books, coaches, it's great and also terrible. I think we're going to have to get used to this. I think this is just going to be the way it is where they're very tight in it and they only say things when they need to and as very little as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it just it just felt weird because like we were all expecting these guys to come back. We were like, okay, we were handling the stretch pretty well. They're going to come back and they're going to help us along afterwards. And now it's like, okay, Kyrie may not be coming back for the season. Honestly, like we might need we might need to prepare for that. And that's all right. I'm I'm cool with that. I think we're still going to make the playoffs. I think we're still going to be fine. But I, I I just would have liked to know that a little more before. I'm not going to lie to you. Greatest frustration with this whole thing is. Where's Jamal Crawford when this I'm not, and I'm not could kidding. Had, I'm not saying this to be a joke. Could have had Mello. Could have had Mello, but I feel like Jamal Crawford's more important to this team well, because right now, yeah, right now his veteran leadership, I think is a little better than Mello's. I'm not knocking Mello, but I feel like Crawford has been more respected everywhere. He goes as a leader and, and Jamal has better handles, his better handles. And I think he is off the bench, a better scoring prowess. I think Mello needs to be a starter to get into a rhythm and play those 25 to 30 minutes, because I feel like he's more of a rhythm scorer, where it takes nothing for Crawford to jump off the bench and in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, do upteen amounts of damage and take over games. And I feel like the guy that would have benefited the most from that was Spencer, because there's been a lot of times where Dinwiddie had to come off the, come off the floor yeah. and the Nets look lost. Yeah. And Wilson Chandler is starting to fill that void because he's starting to find a scoring touch again, which is great. But I really feel like Jamal Crawford could have been an awesome addition to this team, at least for this season. Yeah, uh, we. Yeah, the thing is, he he can be a ball handler, and that's one of the biggest things we need right now. Because Theo Spencer Pinson should not be taking up the ball. I like Theo as a dancer. He shouldn't be a point guard ever. There, there are times where Theo looks all right, but more times he looks rather confused than he is anything else, and that's the main problem. Theo needs more time. You because you can see he. Ha- He's done very good things on the floor before, and then he goes back and makes multiple mistakes. He's just not yeah. ready. And, no, and, uh, I don't know if he's ever going to be ready. I don't think he kind of reminds me of Isaiah Whitehead without the aggression, where talented yeah. kid can play basketball, might just never be talented enough to consistently play in the NBA. Yeah, and we then everyone just lost their three point shooting rhythm. We were we shooting twenty nine percent during a stretch. It, it was it's been awful. Even with open shots, we're just completely missing them, and. It, you know, it's just a bad stretch of games. I'm hoping we can come back into it. Spencer has just been playing well for us. Jared Allen's been all right. DeAndre Jordan's been showing up. Like every, There's people that have been showing up when they have to, but we can't seem to keep it going for a good duration of the game, and we especially can't seem to close games. We can't. Now, I talked about Jamal Crawford, who isn't coming, but David, there is something that is coming and starting in February and soon. You're excited for it. The XFL Very. is coming now we were excited about the aaf and the Very aaf screwed us for a league to fold i love it can't wait screwed us the xfl seems to be doing everything right and the one thing we don't have to worry about is paychecks because vince mcmahon is very rich and he's not going to lose money he's not going to run out of it like the aaf did so that is not going to be something that happens and from everything that they've been doing so far it isn't a showboat league like it was initially they're doing it right And they have some pretty good quarterbacks, and I'm hoping the line play can be good because that was the biggest knock in the AAF. I'm excited, David. I think we're going to try and go to that first game, aren't we, for New York audience? It's 20 bucks. I I advise anyone, anyone and everyone who's listening to this, if you have, and I know you're probably around the New York, New Jersey area. If not, there's other areas where they're playing. But it's like 20 bucks, 25 bucks for like the 100 Texans in MetLife to go see the game at 2 p.m. on Sunday. There, there's really no reason not to. Yeah, the league might not last. It, it, that's a very good possibility. But yeah, why not? Just go have fun on a Sunday. There's going to be no other football on. Go I, New York Guardians. Go Matt exactly. McCloin. Exactly. But, uh, I, yeah, I'm very excited. I know you guys, uh, <laughs> both you and Christina, my sister, got me next up for football. 
Yep, we got the love Guardians it. customized one that they have. Every team has their own custom football, which yep. is pretty cool. Yep, I love it. But uh, no, they're doing everything right. In fact, they're going to... Yeah, I know you just saw me talk about it in uh, our little group, but the XFL, they're coming with new rules that they're doing in the game of football. And tomorrow, they're going to release all their new rules so everyone can look them over and see what's going to happen. One of them that they just like basically teased Double forward passes. I think it has to be behind the line of scrimmage. But I'm hoping isn't gimmicky. I'm just hoping the new rules aren't gimmicky because they've been very good about not being gimmicky. Even like the gimmicky things with the footballs and stuff aren't over the top. I just hope it's not over the top gimmicky. That's my only hope. What it seems like they're trying to do is they're trying to make these games quick. Because in the little video that they had talking about that the rules are coming, they brought up the double forward passes. Because they knew that would be something interesting and something that we haven't seen before. So, I, that, I, if, depending on how that works out, it could be really cool. But they also said rapid fire overtime and very fast games. I I'm don't know excited what, for it. I want to I, no ties, no ties allowed. I want to see what their overtime looks like. Because even if the XFL folds again, we may see the NFL steal another thing from the XFL if that overtime is very good. They stole plenty, so let's hope that it works out, exactly. and let's hope that this episode gets a lot of listens and works out to start the new year, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I'd love that. Everyone, first episode of Quest of Dose in the New Year, first episode of Year 3 of Sports Opinions Podcast in Existence. That's a wrap. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I'm Alex Cuesta. Find me on Twitter and Instagram at A underscore Cuesta 30. Sports Opinions on Twitter at Sports Opinion 30. Instagram, Sports Opinions 30. David on Twitter at dquesta308, um, Instagram at Questacola, and listen to this anywhere you can get a podcast. Word of mouth is huge. And teasing this week's episode of Sports Opinions Podcast, having Yogi Roth on, Pac-12 Network broadcaster. Don't miss that. It's going to be great. Um, Dave, any last words before we close out? Mm, everyone, pay attention to the NFL playoffs. They should be good. Ed, we had a very good wild card weekend. Everyone pay attention to the divisional games. Hopefully we see we see some upsets and we see some good games. Perfect. All right. And with that, that's going to conclude this episode of Quest of Dose. Everybody have a good one.